So thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. Uh, together with my colleague Ian Sinner, we're going to talk about our experiences of being joint chief investigators on a current trial uh, and to try to tell you a little bit about what we've each learned about that. So I'm Paula Williamson, based at the University of Liverpool, and in 2005 I set up the Medicines for Children Research Network Clinical Trials Unit, focusing on clinical trials of medicinal products in children. Um, about five years later, that became the Clinical Trials Research Centre, expanding beyond paediatric trials. And then a couple of years ago, um, that became the Liverpool Clinical Trial Centre, which my colleague, Professor Carol Gamble, now leads. So over the years, I've had a lot of experience of, of different trials in different areas and also working with different chief investigators. Um, I've highlighted four in the middle here, the SANAB trial, the MENS trial, the NURSE trial and the Pirouette trial in heart failure. And I've actually asked those chief investigators for their thoughts on why they wanted to be a chief investigator and things that they learned. Um, and they come from a mix of backgrounds where they'd previously been mentored by a clinician or mentored by myself um, or no mentorship at all, but very experienced clinically. Now, I haven't been a chief investigator of a clinical trial before um, or a joint chief investigator, but I have been a chief investigator for methodological projects, most notably the ORBIT, Outcome Reporting Bias in Trials work, and also the COMET initiative, Core Outcome Measures in Effectiveness Trials, and I'll come back to say more about core outcome sets later. I think most importantly for the trial that Ian and I are working on, um, I've gained some experience of a trial that's actually running through CPRD. And this is a trial for patients with type 2 diabetes running through routine care. And this is where patients are eligible patients are initially identified from the electronic health records. Um, practices that have agreed to take part are sent a list of those potentially eligible patients, her, the GP screens, them and then sends out letters of invitation to the patients. But once the, once the patients have consented to take part, they're randomized, but then they are left to go through routine clinical practice as they normally would. The outcomes are predominantly collected through the electronic health record. So um, I'm a full-time NHS clinician and I work at Alderhey Children's Hospital, which is a busy paediatric hospital in Liverpool um, and most of my time is spent looking after children with asthma and babies with, uh, with, with breathing difficulties and two of my uh, very special patients are uh, on here uh, taking a nebulizer and an inhaler and underneath that picture you'll see um, uh, my asthma team that, that I lead which covers uh, most of the northwest and um, it's a really multidisciplinary team it's a it's a really good team and we this is us winning uh, an award. We win lots of awards because uh, not because of me, but because of the team, really. Um, and uh, one of the things that is, is quite uh, important about that is that by the time I've seen a child with asthma, they've been through a whole load of people with lots of other expertise uh, and, and, and lots of different experiences. And it's really interesting for me as a tertiary regional specialist to be conducting a, a trial like uh, asymptomatic, which we'll be discussing today, which is largely run in primary care. Um, as with, uh, as like many other clinicians, I've got a few different hats. I'm very interested in research and have a background uh, in, uh, uh, in conducting uh, research, um, but not really clinical trials. So I did my PhD, in fact, under the supervision of, of Paula, um, and uh, Professor Ross Smith in, in, in Liverpool. Um, and that was uh, looking at core outcome sets in, in children. And it was from there really that I developed a real interest in evidence-based medicine and have done some work with the, um, uh, with, with the Cochrane um, uh, co uh, collaboration and uh, with the um, uh, NIHR. Uh, and, and also we've been doing some work about um, uh, about evidence-based medicine in asthma with the European Respiratory Society. Uh, and finally, I've got some hats that land in leadership as well. So I'm involved in various national leadership programmes, again, about asthma. And my real motivation to do those is that when we look at outcomes for children with asthma across the UK, we should be doing a lot better than we are. Our outcomes with regards to asthma admissions and hospitalisations are poor compared to other uh, countries in Europe. And so there's a lot of interest 
in getting, getting things better for children with asthma. And, and so with my job focusing so much on asthma, um, it was uh, a no brainer to me when I got a phone call from Paula one day a couple of uh, years ago to say that um, NIHR were um, putting out a call for data enabled trials that were um, ambitious and, and answering important questions in primary care. Uh, and, and Paula said, are there any important questions uh, in paediatrics that could be answered using routine data in primary care? And at that very point, I thought to myself, well, since you asked, there was a huge question that we needed to answer in childhood asthma. It could not have been more timely. Um, and that conversation really led on to the asymptomatic uh, trial. Um, and uh, just by way of background about why we're, we're, why, why we're doing that, asthma um, is, is the commonest chronic condition of childhood. It affects one in 10 children in the UK. Um, and we know that when children take their treatments in the right way, they benefit, they, they, they get better and they have less asthma attacks. And we've been um, giving these treatments in much the same way for a long time now. So we have been giving children inhaled corticosteroids every day, um, regardless of whether they're on a good day or a bad day, they get the same dose of inhaled steroids. But more recently, over the last three or four years, um, in large adult and adolescent studies in the States, um, in people with mild asthma, um, these were non-inferiority studies which suggested that giving inhaled steroids as needed, in other words, a symptom-driven approach, was non-inferior to giving them daily. And this process of, of, of saying to uh, people with asthma, okay, take your inhaled steroids. If you've got mild asthma, it's well controlled. Take your inhaled steroids only as and when you need them is a mile away from what we've been doing for decades in, in pediatric asthma. And so it was really important to us that we, that, that we thought about that question and what it might, might mean for us. And the reason that we had to think that we, we know that in the adult world, this is the way things are moving towards symptom-driven inhaled steroids. But, you know, as pediatricians, we say this every day, children aren't small adults. There are differences in uh, asthma, there are differences in physiology, there are differences in the pathology, and there are differences in the logistics of using the inhalers as and when needed. So we can quite happily say to an adult, okay, carry this inhaler around. When children are in school, they don't necessarily have control of their inhalers. So um, there, there are real issues before we transpose and, and inherit adult guidelines in children. Um, and we really wanted to study this in children to check that it was the right thing to do. So in our study, asymptomatic, we're comparing daily versus symptom-driven inhaled steroids in children aged uh, in between 6 and 16 years, so primary and secondary school, who have mild asthma. And it's a non-inferiority question with a margin of 5%, the primary outcome being asthma attacks requiring treatment with oral steroids. It's completely based in, uh, in primary care, and specifically we are including practices who contribute data to the uh, CPRD data link. Um, so the way that this will, that, that this will work is that CPRD will screen uh, codes for eligible children in terms of the age range, in terms of a current diagnosis of asthma, uh, and also in terms of mild disease by way of treatment level. Um, which is well controlled, which they will determine by children not having um, a lot of asthma attacks in the preceding 12 months. And it's a big study. This will be the second largest ever RCT in childhood asthma, and we're aiming for 2,000 uh, children. The children will be treated for a 12 month period, which um, is longer than many pediatric asthma studies, but it's important that we take into account a good treatment period that, that, that covers all four seasons. Asthma is a very seasonal condition. Um, it's really important to us that the study is um, reflective of routine practice and what actually happens um, when people have consultations with, with primary care. And we wanted to minimise the burden on a really stretched and, and really um, busy primary care service in the UK at the moment. So, but in particular, we didn't want to have any extra study appointments and we didn't want GPs to spend 
too long uh, working on the study. Um, so one of the key things that's enabling us to do that is that the trial is run using uh, routinely collected data, specifically the primary outcome of asthma attacks, and those data will be from CPRD and linked HES data. We're looking at some other outcomes as well, so um, we'll be looking at parent reported outcomes at various points, um, and uh, the pharmacovigilance will be by, uh, by GP report. Um, we are opening uh, very soon. In fact, by the time you see this, I think we will be open, and we're hoping to uh, stay open and recruit for two and a half years. So it's an ambitious study, but it's a really important study. Thanks, Ian. So this study, the design actually um, addresses one of the questions that was prioritised in the priority one study conducted by, or led by members of the TMRN uh, in Ireland uh, with many collaborators um, elsewhere. And that question was, how can randomised trials become part of routine care and best utilise current clinical care pathways? And Ian's mentioned that we hope to reduce the burden or minimise the burden for primary care staff, but we also want to minimise the burden for patients taking part in uh, asymptomatic. But basing a trial entirely on data routinely collected, we, for that, we need to also balance um, against what are the most important outcomes that matter to key stakeholders, including here parents and uh, children with asthma. And Ian and I uh, worked on a core outcome set, Ian, it was part of Ian's PhD, and this was four uh, clinical trials in childhood asthma. And the main core outcomes are on the right hand side. The first one, exacerbations, and the last one, mortality, are available from uh, electronic health records, as Ian has already said. but for the other two, symptom, asthma symptom control and, and quality of life. Um, whilst there are you know, often aspects of those um, outcomes that are in routine health records, possibly in, mainly in free text, there's no um, structured assessments available in the electronic health record uh, on a sufficiently sort of structured and regular basis. And this is the key challenge, or one of the key challenges in terms of trying to run trials through routine care, and that is that the collection of patient reported outcome data isn't collected routinely uh, in most cases. So we need to take into consideration the potential problem about missing PRO data. Um, and so for this, uh, and trying to minimize this, I turn to the uh, recent update uh, of the Cochrane Review led by Katie Gillis to see what it said about ways in which we might uh, increase data collection uh, in trials. That review finally found 67 studies of interventions with participants rather than interventions aimed at staff. Uh, those studies were mostly about responses to postal questionnaires. We are setting up our PROs online, again, to try to ease the burden for parents and children. A priority research question from this Cochrane review was to investigate um, the effectiveness of electronic prompts and reminders. And whilst CPRD's system can offer email prompts and reminders, we also want to look into um, a comparison with SMS text prompts and, and reminders. So at the moment, we are designing a SWOT um, that we're going to introduce, introduce Sort of shortly after the trial is opened for recruitment, we'll be adding it in, um, but the final design is still to be agreed. So if anybody is working on anything similar, we'd be really keen to talk to you um, afterwards. So hopefully we've convinced you that in this particular trial, the asymptomatic trial, there are both important clinical questions, but also important methodological questions and decisions to be made. And that's the reason that Ian and I went forward as joint chief investigators to the NIHR HGA Data Enabled Trial Corps. And this is how we worded uh, the justification for being joint CIs. We said that the asymptomatic trial will require strong leadership in both the clinical and data enabled trials domains. Dr. Sinner's experience in the care for children with asthma and paediatric research, combined with Professor Williamson's clinical trials experience, including studies based specifically on routine health records, will strengthen trial delivery. And we were keen to find out 
how many other HGA trials actually have joint chief investigators. Um, so with the help of uh, um, the NHR, we found the data from the last three years of awards from the HGA programme. And over those three years, 234 awards were made and 11% of them were with joint leads. And you can see that it has been increasing, increasing over the last couple of years. Of those 26, the majority of them were there with joint clinical leads. And this tended to be a um, less experienced uh, clinician mentored by a more experienced clinician who had trials experience. There were um, nine joint leads, joint chief investigators, where one was clinical and one was methodological. And there was one where both the leads were methodological. That was a uh, study related more to cost effectiveness. So this is how we found ourselves. We couldn't find anything written about how to be joint chief investigators. We have been making it up as we go along, um, working out who needs to do what and when, when we need joint decisions and when we can um, sort of make decisions on our own if one of us isn't around at the time. Uh, and this is rather how, it, how it's working out so far. So in, in preparing these slides, Paula and I reflected on why we wanted to be joint CIs, and we did this independently. And, and th these were the things that, that, that I came up with. Um, so firstly, I mentioned before that I've got some, uh, some experience in, in, in doing and, and contributing to research, but this was certainly my first trial as a, as a chief investigator. And um, having spent some time in the clinical trials unit, I knew that, um, uh, that, that this could be a minefield where I could get things horribly wrong. And I really wanted someone with experience of conducting and leading trials alongside uh, me. And, you know, with that, I wanted someone that I that, that I know and that I trust and that I, you know, I mentioned I've, I've been um, Paula's PhD student in the past and we've done work since. And, uh, and so I was confident that Paula um, knows both my strengths and my weaknesses. Um, and, you, you know, I, I think that's a, re a really important part of, of, of that process. Um, again, from having worked uh, within a CTU as a clinical fellow, I knew that there were several moving parts that, that, that happened within an RCT. Um, and um, this whole idea of, of those coming to, to, together, I think, is also important. And particularly for a trial like this, with quite a few extra considerations, quite a few novel and, and new methodological approaches and, and, and complexities needed really strong leadership. And the reason that that's important is because we, we it's, you know, as a clinician, as a full-time clinician, we rely on, on really good quality, top quality, robust research to help our patients. Um, and again, as a clinician, I know the frustrations of really exciting trials failing and, and leaving us still uncertain about how best to manage the children that come to our clinic. So I absolutely needed the best team around me and alongside Paula, I think we've got a really strong team of, um, of, of co-investigators as well, it's really good. Again, there's a lot resting on what happens with the results of asymptomatic. My estimate is that there's probably around 200 to 250 million children with mild asthma around the world. And uh, these findings of, of whether to use daily or symptom-driven inhaled steroids will have a massive bearing on their lives. Uh, so it's really important that we get this right. And for me, that was the key driver for being a joint CI is knowing your strengths and weaknesses and knowing that you need someone else around you who can complement. So for me, why did I want to be a joint CI? Well, I mentioned before that I'd asked some of my uh, chief investigator colleagues sort of why they wanted to be a chief investigator because I wanted to reflect on whether some of their reasons were similar to my own um, and, and one of my colleagues said well for me it was ownership of the original idea and following the project through to completion no one else is as committed or interested as the person who started the ball rolling uh, the person whose idea it was 
Well, that's equally true. It's true for Ian with the clinical question, but it's equally true for me with the methodological issues around running trials through uh, routine care and indeed trying to collect patient reported outcome data alongside. One of my clinical colleagues uh, said that they wanted the challenge of being a chief investigator. Um, and for me, um, I really wanted to understand the chief investigator perspective. I've worked with a lot of different chief investigators over the years. I've heard a lot from chief investigators. Um, and I really wanted to sort of get a better understanding of, of um, where their uh, thoughts, where their stresses, where their concerns uh, are actually coming from. And, and, and a further reason that, that uh, one of my colleagues sort of mentioned was so he said that the chief investigator is but one member of a large team, each member of which has their own unique skills, each member is of equal importance and value. The chief investigator is only the lead name, but has a very important role in ensuring this equality. And I absolutely agree with that idea of equality, but I feel that we need to ensure that there is recognition that this area is actually team science. I think team science is starting to be recognized in laboratory research, I'm not so sure it's so well recognized in clinical trials. And that's another motivation for, for wanting to be a joint chief investigator. And that links to uh, the idea that uh, we should be trying to promote the importance of methodology and this fantastic paper that came out recently around uh, methodology over metrics um, it concludes Although methodology is undeniably the backbone of high quality and responsible research, science consistently undervalues methodology. Uh, I would add that it consistently undervalues methodologists, not everywhere, but in some uh, areas, in some places. Uh, and I feel that as methodologists, we do need to document the met our methodological decisions, we need to explain them, and we certainly need to disseminate better what we actually do as methodologists. So, so, so bearing all that in, in mind, what have we learned so far about being joint CIs? Um, I think, uh, firstly, and, and this was no surprise to me in some ways, that setting up a trial is outside my comfort zone. Um, I, I knew that there were a lot of things that I didn't know about trials. I didn't quite know how many things I didn't know about setting up a trial. Uh, and again, luckily for me, um, uh, you know, but Paula knows this. Paula knows my experiences to date, and she knows the things that I haven't done yet. Um, and again, Paula's had experience of, of working with other um, trialists and, and knows the pitfalls in doing studies. And that includes knowledge of the systems, knowledge of the infrastructure, knowledge of the governance, you know, th things which often um, probably make um, uh, you know, probably very easy for people who work in research all the time to, to get their head around and in trials to get their head around that are not necessarily things that come um, second nature to clinicians. Um, and alongside that, uh, I've found it invaluable having someone alongside me to say who does what, when, and crucially, why. You know, I don't always know, um, you know, what with this being the first trial that I'm co-leading, I, I don't always know what the priority at that point is, because it doesn't necessarily jump out as, as being a priority. So having someone alongside saying where things can go wrong and why certain things are important is, has been absolutely crucial, particularly in the stage up till now where we've been uh, designing and setting up the study. But I think it's really working. And um, it's certainly working from my perspective, <laughs> on just follow the slide in a second, but the way that I see this, it, it is really working. And, we have um, a lot of respect, I think, for each other and um, of our different areas of expertise. The communication that we have is, is crucial. We communicate regularly and um, we've now started uh, catching up at set points in the week as well as ad hoc, you know, catching up as, as needed. And that's really important. And um, again, for a trial where there are so many things moving and um, it, it's really important that we, that we know what's going on. And, and um, I think we're also good at sharing responsibilities and tasks, both in terms of those being uh, equitable in terms of the, the, the workload, but more importantly, in terms of um, who might be able to get the best outcome for the study. So it, it does seem to be working 
well. Um, I think it's been an invaluable thing to do. Um, uh, and these are some of the things that I've done. And so what about me? So some of these things I knew before uh, and some of them I definitely know better now. Um, I think I always knew that a trial manager is absolutely key and it's no different here. Uh, Ian and I must thank Nick Harmon and Claire Isles. Uh, their work has been amazing in getting us to where we are and hopefully recruiting <laughs> as we speak. Um, Ian's already mentioned the workload issue. Um, what one of my CI colleagues has said, um, it was it, you know it really helped to have a team and distributing the workload. I would say I concur with Ian about being joint CIs is about sharing responsibility. Um, I definitely feel I have a better relationship with Ian as a CI than I've ever had with any CI when I was a CTU director. Now, why is that? I think it's because we have more direct communication uh, and we are providing mutual support for each other as um, another CI who had been mentored um, also said. Uh, the communication is more direct and there are a lot more texts than I've ever used before and I do not have enough emojis on, in my phone uh, to express <laughs> things succinctly. Um, but other comments that chief investigator said about uh, what they learned as being a chief investigator that I would agree with. Tenacity is key. Never give up and roll with the punches. Keep calm and carry on. I have to say, Ian and I compliment each other. He is very calm. Uh, I'm often not. Uh, and there is a solution to most problems, and that's definitely one of Ian's strengths. He's a very positive, let's find a solution kind of person. Uh, somebody also said you should work with the team, play to your strengths and just don't get in others' way. <laughs> uh, you know, I think and hopefully Ian and I are not getting in each other's way. Now, communication, I knew how important that was before, but I have to say what I know now is it's not just about communication. It's actually about open and transparent communication. Um, and that's what's really crucial. So what have I learned? I mean, being a chief investigator, being a joint chief investigator, you feel, you really do feel, it is your ultimate responsibility um, with public money, with recruitment of, of patient participants and also retention. And it does feel like it is our heads on the block. And although I felt that to a degree as a CTU director, I have to say I feel it much more strongly, more acutely now. Um, so one of my colleagues said that the role of a CI was you can only really appreciate this when you have been there, done it and got the T-shirt. Um, and I am definitely learning what it is like to be a chief investigator. And I'd like to think I'd have more understanding than perhaps I had before. Uh, and finally, team science. Um, I do believe that um, we need to develop, recognise and reward team scientists. I also think it's really important to try and understand each other's worlds as members of the team so to understand and ideally experience where possible so it is possible for me given my um experience to date to be a joint chief investigator it won't be a, you know possible for everybody until they've reached a, a level of experience uh, to be able to do that but i think it's been invaluable to me recognition it, it is about <laughs> recognition for the work that team scientists do. It's not just contribution statements in publications, um, but, but other uh, recognition as well. And reward in terms of career pathways for team scientists, that's also really important. So we wanted to ask you uh, who you thought was Wallace in this situation and who you thought was uh, putting Gromit in the rocket. In my head, you're Wallace and I'm Gromit. I don't know how you, Feel about it, but uh, but that's where we've uh, that's where we've come up to today. And thank you very much indeed for uh, a the invitation to to come and talk at this lovely symposium, and um, but but also for your time and, and attention for our slides. Thank you very much. Thank you.